What's it? So uh, we're coming together again for another discussion between me and Dr. Weisfeld. I've got a collection of questions and other bits of discussionary topics that we're going to sift through, um, a lot of which to give a general understanding of whom Dr. Weisfeld is and the, uh, just to understand the long history that exists to Weisfeld's experiences in regards to engaging in political struggle. Yeah, yeah, there is a too much. <laughs> <laughs> Seems there's still more to keep adding to the list as well. <laughs> yeah, I was starting to get worn out, but now uh, my doctor is getting me all fixed up, you know, so I'll be able to go for another 15 years. <laughs> a lot can happen in 15 years. <laughs> Thanks to the healthcare system in Canada. It was Tommy Douglas that brought about uh, socialized medicine in Canada, you know, from the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation. Good name. Then they changed to uh, Social Democratic NDP, but that's another story. Well, it's uh, I, you know, there's only so far that these people are willing to give any dividends into the poor. As soon as it starts getting to a point where it don't suit them too much, they'll fly by the other wheel. I don't know. The poor are expendable, you know, like there's 8 million Canadians on a waiting list, you know, for a surgical operation. I understand there's 6 million waiting in England, Britain, for some surgical procedure. And meanwhile, uh, Britain is, you know, like moving, you know, like there's, you know, uh, practically a general strike, you know, to get more funding for the public uh, health care system. Here in Canada, no, we just suffer quietly while we freeze. <laughs> uh, uh, same please, thank you, and sorry, eh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In both English and French. <laughs> it's like a blend of like um uh all the abuses of the Anglosphere, but they'll be nice to you while they do it. <laughs> oh yes, very nice, yeah. <laughs> Polite. You know, British politeness, yes. It's 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 uh something something to see. Okay, I mean, what's your first question? Well, uh, the um, firing it off from the get-go, what was it like growing up a refugee and a second-generation Holocaust um, survivor, especially in the West? Wow. You know, like, I didn't even know what I was, you know, at first. At first, I was just, you know, like, my parents, you know, who survived, you know, and, and spoke to each other in Polish, and they spoke with me in Yiddish. And when I went to, uh, when I was switched to a public school system, like, I didn't know English, <laughs> you know, except for, you know, uh, American television, which I started to pick up in 1956. Oh, but, uh, you know, like uh, a year or two of American television, that's all I had, you know, to go with, you know, to start, you know, the uh, public school system after I switched, you know, from the Jewish Orthodox, you know, day school system, because uh, my Canadian cousin said that my mother should do it. So I come into this school you know, like hardly speaking any English and they, and they, you know, send me back to the grade one, you know, because, because, you know, that's, and they had nothing, you know, to, to, uh, you know, introduce, you know, uh, transition classes or nothing to, you know, uh, teach uh, new immigrants, you know, how to speak English or anything like that. No, you have to do it all on your own. And then I end up going to this primary school called King Edward, you know, school. Who's King Edward? King Edward was the guy in 1292, who expelled all the Jewish people from England, okay? So, so I, I walk into this King Edward school, and you know, like nobody talks to me, you know, because one, the, you know, uh, the Christians, you know, uh, thought that the Jewish people were sort of, you know, like um, not to be friends with. And so nobody talked with me and I didn't speak with any Christians, you know, because, you know, we were told, you know, that the Christians were uh, dangerous and were our enemy. So, you know, like I just went through there uh, without uh, just listening to teachers talk, basically, you know, so started to concentrate, focusing on, you know, what I could learn. And that was about it. Then what happens, you know, grade six, Mr. Gardner in our class, in the midst of, you know, some scientific presentation. And when he got close to me on the side of the classroom, you know, as if he was answering me when I had not said anything at all in, you know, in order to, you know, like make the students, you know, the Christian 
students, you know, feel better about the Holocaust, which everybody knew about. And he says, and the Jews killed Christian babies in the Middle Ages, just like that, you know, like quick, and then goes on with the scientific thing, you know, just to, okay, this is King Edward, you know, like, come to life again. And this, it's so sick and twisted. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, like, without even thinking about it, you know, like, I, I, I reacted automatically, you know, spontaneously, stood up without permission, of course, pointed to the teacher and, and yelled, practically yelled. I don't know if I yelled. But anyway, I said, that's a lie. Okay. So, like, the whole class, you know, just, like, froze, you know, like, complete, you know, neurotic, you know, trance for everybody, including the teacher who was just frozen there, standing there, looking at me, you know, me looking at him, you know, eye to eye. So, you know, like, <laughs> grade six, you know, so this Holy was an act of rebellion, you know, this is, you know, my first public act of rebellion there. And the teacher, you know, just ignored, you know, me, and I didn't know what else to say. I should have, caught, you know, made a speech or something. But anyway, you know, I, I just sat down quietly, politely, and, uh, you know, things went on, you know, until we had a fight uh, at the end of the year when uh, I threw a, a rubber ball uh, to the teacher. It missed, I missed, you know, but he got angry and he picked up the ball and started chasing me with it and uh, ran me down and hit me in the back, you know, with the rubber ball. Abusive little wanker. I mean, he had it coming. He was the one who was being the prank. He deserved the ball to be thrown at him. Yeah. Um, and I mean, uh, you know, at the end of the day, the way you stood up, nonetheless, the fact he was so flabbergasted, he didn't get you sent straight for a cane and is a, a victory in and of itself. Oh, yeah. Um, also, you kind of see the two differences between like the way the British do anti-Semitism and then the U.S.'s weird Judeo-Christianity anti-Semitism, where the, yeah. like, the Christians have two different ways. Yeah, we just fucking, we're just anti-Semitic. We just, uh, we'll, we'll try and virtue signal now since World War II, but. Uh, we were very clear up until about the 40s uh, like being completely anti-Jewish and wanting them all out of our country and being very open about that. And so uh -huh. the Protestant sect, even though it basically is just its own brand of Catholicism of England, is uh, much more openly anti-Semitic than what um, the Americans devise, where their anti-Semitism is more centered around Christians, utilizing the fact that, oh, well, part of the Abrahamic faith. So we're Judeo-Christians now. We really respect our Jewish heritage, and they yeah. don't. What they do is they push for this very specific idea of what a Jewish person should uh, attenuate as, and that is uh, as a Christian that calls himself a Jew. Um, <laughs> ben Shapiro, basically. <laughs> oh, my, yes. Yeah, it's it's so comical and tragic at the same time. But uh, yeah, I was there, and uh, you know, like I I was raised uh, socialist and Bundist, you know, so I, I I never had any illusions about Zionism or capitalism, you know, like uh, socialism was was just was it, you know, that was all there was. Uh, you know, to uh, to say, you know, it was obvious, you know, that we had to be socialists. And uh, and then, you know, my mother, uh, part, you know, my mother was a Bundist, you know, like, uh, we, she didn't, you know, come out as a Bundist, you know, none of the uh, refugees, you know, would come out as a Bundist or, you know, criticize Zionism for its treatment of the Palestinians because they were afraid. Because, uh, you know, there were a few of us and the Canadian Jewish community, which was generally pro-Zionist, you know, was... Uh, you know, they would they would have uh, ostracized you know anybody you know who, who made any public statements to that effect, and in fact that's what happened to me, and uh, death threats and uh, and uh, physical uh, menacing you know when we were demonstrating and that sort of thing. So, but my mother and I you know we were like a secret collaborators, and uh, even though they tried to sort of instill us with uh, certain. Uh, Zionist, you know, ideology in the um, in the Cheder, in the Jewish Hebrew school. Not, no, it wasn't a Hebrew school, it was a Talmud Torah. So it was teaching a, a Yiddish as an oral language, you know, but we studied, you know, the the text, you know, translating from um, Hebrew into English over a period of seven years, you know, an evening school that I went to in addition to the public uh, Protestant school during the daytime. Yeah. And, uh, 
so I don't have any sort of transition story to give to you, you know, like most other, you know, Jewish anti-Zionists, you know, say, oh, they were raised Zionists and they became anti-Zionists because of this or that, like the 1982 Sefer Shatila massacre, which was a turning point for a lot of people. And for the Communist Party, the turning point was 1967. Before that, they were pro-Zionist. Then after, they were just two staters, two state solution people. So, which is not much better than being a supporter of Zionists. <laughs> yeah, which is not much better. So, huh. um, uh, what is it? Apathy leads to fascism. Yeah, yeah. And, I, um, you know, what I'd say, it's something I somewhat envy because, I mean, in my own tackles with politics, I was far right for a long period of my life. And then I ended up having my entire world torn out of my ass all inside and out. It's the best way I can express it. It's like the whole thing with Marx and Hegel is that, you know, Hegel on his head inside out. Uh -huh. I had that happen to me and uh, I had to reconstruct the way I looked at the world. Um, uh -huh. Uh, entirely and I had like because it was a big cataclysmic effect I had had off of a, a weird trip I ended up having with LSD well acid not LSD but everyone calls it yeah, yeah. was pumped acid LSD but um, basically I was already having experiences that were knocking off my racism with discount in the way I was believing and then I took this trippies and I didn't even take that much it was just towards the end of the night I started contemplating about who I am uh, it, uh, and because of time dilation occurs when you're on trippies because it's yeah. like being in a dream state yeah. I went through like who I am as a person in a very extensive manner and my life my, sorry my mind basically just like locked the key away you ain't feeling like that anymore you ain't connecting with that anymore that's evil um, I, and uh, you know I, I, I was really distraught I was really upset at the time when it was happening I fell asleep I woke up the next morning and I just didn't feel the same person Everything I was engaging with felt like I'd never done it before, but I could remember how many times I'd done it, be walking through places I hadn't walked. Uh, I'd walked through a million times, but it felt like I'd never been there before. And uh -huh. so I had to rebuild the way I perceived every one of my experiences. Uh-huh, yeah. Yeah, acid uh, will do that, you know, because before, you know, like people are just accustomed to operating on on believing, you know, the accumulation of information that they've been fed, you know, previously. But they've never sort of, you know, taken the time to analyze it, never been taught how to analyze it, never been taught how to think, and never taught how to be independent in thought. So, you know, like an acid, you know, if you've got the uh, prerequisites, you know, acid will teach you how to do all that. <laughs> and then you look at yourself, you know, and, um, you know, from a perspective that's, uh, I don't know where it is, you know, but it's, uh, it's something that you can do, you know, for yourself. You can actually look at yourself and know yourself by yourself. It's sort of an interesting phenomena. And uh, and so you can see, you know, what you are, what you are sort of, you know, trained to be, modeled to be, and then you can decide, you know, what you want to be. And it it, it has that moment, Terry, because it, it comes with very specific conditions, because there was also a problem with I have where I've had a go at trippers, where it's like you can't treat it as like, a, now we should do it every two weeks. Kind of thing, guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, um, I've done it once. I don't think I need to do it again. I'm glad with the results I got. <laughs> the, um, but yeah, no, it's that like third perspective moment that I had with it. It was like I was auditing over someone else. And so I had no like, none of my biases of it being about myself allowed me to stop from chastigating myself and tearing myself apart. Uh -huh. And because of the dilation effects of the, uh, the uh, REM motions going on in your brain at that point, uh -huh. you've got a lot of time to contemplate on it without the time needing to be a lot of time. Uh -huh. Well, my big transition was uh, like that grade six experience, you know, where I, I knew what I was, you know, but I was afraid to, to be it, you know, in public. Afraid to, you know, fear is the most sort of, you know, like dominant sort of factor of being a second generation Holocaust survivor. But I'm conscious of the fear and I can overcome it. So, and I did spontaneously at that time in grade six. But since then, even then, it's always a struggle, you know, to come out with, uh, with your identity and with your own thoughts. It's something that... Um, takes a, a like a little revolution in of yourself you know inside of yourself yeah i'm going through that now with uh what's it transition mm -hmm. okay so 
What's the next question? Um, oh, my mouse is right clicked, I can't see. Uh, how did these experiences growing up enforce your political developments as you grew from a young rebellious lad into a radical and rebellious man? And how did your impoverished upbringing advance these developments? Yeah, well, you know, one thing that was a constant feature of when I was a teenager was that on Saturday, you know, like until I was not a teenager, but pre-teenage, until 14, you know, I was Orthodox. Oh, yes, this is a transition that I should speak about. Because, you know, I was raised uh, Orthodox, modern Orthodox. Um, and uh, I, I, on Saturdays, you know, I wouldn't uh, go to play sports or, or something, you know, like that. Um, you know, you're supposed, to, I didn't know, you know, there were a lot of things that you could not do. And so I would go to the library and read books. So every Saturday I'd go in and I'd read, you know, and uh, that's how I taught myself a more sophisticated English and uh, how I uh, developed a certain precision and uh, method of, uh, of, of, uh, of study that uh, was forever useful. So, and then I, I wouldn't even, you know, like take the uh, streetcar, you know, the electric uh, train in the city at the time. I would walk there because, you know, you weren't supposed to use anything, you know, motorized on Saturday, you know, Shabbos, you know. So I, I'd walk, you know, a few kilometers get down to the library, stay there all day and, and forget, you know, that I was reading it. You know, even after supper time, one time my mother had to call up the library and ask the librarian to call me to come home to eat supper. You know? <laughs> That's brilliant. Yeah. So that was, you know, one way, you know, like the library, you know, is one way I broke out of my isolation in, uh, and uh, at the age of 14, you know, when I had the right to be an adult and think like an adult after my bar mitzvah, well, then I examined, you know, what uh, my context was, you know, which was the Holocaust and, uh, you know, consider that uh, relying upon a deity to take care of you in a time of crisis, you know, it's not the way to go because it didn't work. So, you know, that's what everybody sort of realized, all of the, you know, survivors. And uh, we never talked about, you know, like any sort of, you know, critical or doubtful sort of, you know, impressions about religion per se. We just sort of left it aside, you know, it wasn't important enough. And we didn't want to sort of, you know, have to contend with our own upbringing and to because, you know, we were sort of trying to find, you know, another, another way to be Jewish, you know, because, you know, a religious way to be Jewish, you know, wasn't good enough. So the Bundist, you know, thought uh, was neutral in the question of religion. So it took care of that and turned into a question that wasn't a question anymore because it wasn't a question that could be answered. So we just, you know, left it aside. But it was the uh, political identity that was very important for us. And we weren't allowed to express it within the Jewish community and nobody outside of the Jewish community, you know, wanted to know what our our political positions were and didn't even want to know, you know, whether or not we existed. You know, <laughs> it was just the Holocaust was over, you know, let's forget about it, you know, for everybody else. And for us, uh, well, it was a matter of something that uh, we wanted to be recognized, but we weren't allowed to have it recognized because uh, one, you know, one no, first of all, we, you know, people didn't want to upset anybody else, you know, by talking about the Holocaust and putting them on spot, you know, to either account for it or to uh, regret it or to apologize for it because they didn't do anything, you know, like the Canadian Jewish community did nothing to help, you know, like the Jewish people of Europe, you know, to fight the Holocaust and all they were concerned about was getting, you know, Jewish refugees into Palestine after the war, you know, because they were pro-Zionist. So that's where they belong. And besides, they didn't want us here in Canada because we spoke Yiddish and we sort of, you know, tended to uh, uh, fit into a, a stereotype of what the English Canadians thought we were. And they didn't want to be thought of in that way. You know, they wanted to be thought of as Canadians and first and not, and, and not Jewish first. So, you know, they didn't welcome us very well, even within our own family. So, you know, that's the way it was. And that's the way it still is, actually. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's um, absolutely mental because, like, there's basically the two ways that it goes about it with anti-Semitism. You're either despised by the non-Jewish people who, who uh, will either blatantly try and suggest that Jewish people are on a pedestal, which is wrong. Um, or secondly, you'll get the, the virtue signals. They'll virtue signal about how much they hate the fact that Mr. Hitler went on a crusade against the Jews when actually they're not bothered about that. What they're bothered about is that Hitler went and invaded them in the same way they invade everyone else. That's the big problem that Europe has with, with the Nazis. They don't have a problem with their massacre of the Roma, the Jews, the, the, uh, the disabled, yeah. uh, the Slavs, um, and many other millions of people. They don't give a shit about that. Like, yeah. and, um, and then you've got the other side of the fence, um, Jewish or not Jewish, where you have uh, the, the pro-Zionists. And, and the pro-Zionists, if you're a Jewish person who is incredibly westernized, in, uh, Western Europeanized, where you, are, uh, more, you, have more, um, you have more of a social relationship with whiteness than you do with your own Jewish heritage, mm -hmm. then, uh, you know, you're acceptable and wanted in these Western regions. They're not too bothered about shipping you off to Israel. But if you see all the way from the Balfour Declaration at the turn of 1917, the uh, the Anglo Sphere's mentality has been as if you're um, uh, if you're what they perceive as stereotypically Jewish, they want you on a boat straight to Palestine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh well, yeah. I mean, the uh, the Zionist uh, plan for the Jewish people was first uh, published in a work in 1835 in England, where it was um, it was uh, thought of as, as as a colonial strategy and a way to take care of the Jewish problem or the Jewish question, as it's more politely termed in in. Uh, classical Marxist theory. But, <laughs> <laughs> I've heard about that book. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's difficult. But uh, I don't know. You know, it's still difficult. It's still so difficult, you know, to get a hearing, you know, for the Jewish Bundes position. And uh, uh, it's uh, not only because of uh, the ideological boycott by the Zionists, but it's the ide ideological boycott by most uh, uh, Marxist uh, tendencies as well. You know, even in the uh, Trotskyist movement, which I experienced for seven years, from 66, oh, it's longer, 66 to 76, um, there was no recognition of Jewish people as such, as a people. It was only considered to be a religion. And if you made any allusion to Jewishness, you know, you were immediately suspected of being, you know, like a closet uh, uh, religious person, you know. <laughs> and, and one time a comrade, you know, who's a Holocaust, uh, a second generation Holocaust survivor as well, became a lawyer, Harry Capito. You know, one time, you know, when he was frustrated with the uh, Trotsky's comrades in a branch meeting, and he said, oh God, can't you see, you know, something like that. Then this other guy, Ian Angus, gets up and says, oh, you refer to God. You cannot do that here. And it's, you know, like you have no right to do that here, you know, as if, you know, he meant, you know, it's the only way he could contest his, you know, like position. And this is, you know, how they do it. And then there's the philo-Semitic position in which, oh, yes, Jews are wonderful. Da -da -da -da. We want to be Jews, you know, but we call ourselves Christians and all this sort of thing, you know. Um, and we are the real Jews now, you know, because we carry on tradition, you know, of uh, of whatever. And the Christians uh, are the modern Jews. That's the Mormons, straight yeah, up. <laughs> Jude Judea Christianity, you know, all of a sudden is some sort of a doctrine that I've never heard of before, you know. And who <laughs> teaches us about this doctrine of Judea Christianity? Well, it's the Protestants, you know. Like, did the <laughs> Trust you know, agree to thoughts. this? You know, like, no, did I, you know, like even one Jewish person even agree to this? No, not necessarily. You know, like, no, the one they, in, in 1870 summit, they found themselves uh, 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 an atheist uh, Zionist and they got him to agree with them. So it's okay, guys, don't worry about it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Netanyahu's there, you know, like he's uh, 
the bridge of Judeo Christianity, you know, he's even an American, you know, to boot. And there he is, you know, now with this, you know, what kind of government is it that they have now there? And it's, you know, uh, neo fascist or, or theo, theo fascist or. They've been around that long. They're just the old fascists from before. <laughs> it's the old fascists from 48. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, my, my. And I mean, the fact Netanyahu's back is just, that's the most absurd thing that's happened in the last like six or seven months for me is just like, yeah. How? Because they, I, 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 the only reason that they could be bringing him back in is just because the, because uh, um, I remember speaking to, um, I, I was speaking to a Marxist Leninist who lives in Israel, and he's telling me about how the civil society in Israel, the public civil society, is more fascistic than the government. Like they want an all out, bl like bloodier war than even the government could satisfy themselves with. Hmm. Um, and so, it's quite likely that that very fascistic civil society is caused for the push of the return of Netanyahu. I mean, Netanyahu was basically offed by the bourgeoisie for someone else. Like they, they picked outright to go the other way. The fact he's back is like the fact that Trump or DeSantis is likely going to take over in America next year. Like it's the rise of fascism. Yeah. Uh, this is, it shows uh, as well, you know, the dead end of the Zionist ideology because they have nowhere to go. They are just repeating what they had before only worse. So now they have Smoltich, you know, is now the head of uh, uh, the West Bank, you know, as a, as a second minister of defense. And, and he's in charge of the civil administration of the West Bank. And so it's not under the military occupation control anymore. It is more so under the control of the civil administration, which means that they have, you know, de facto annexed the West Bank, you know, to the state of Israel. Yeah. But, you know, <laughs> they don't say they're doing it, but they're doing it. It's so, frontier yeah. culture. I mean, this is like uh, that famous quote from, um, uh, I can't remember which uh, US um, uh, uh, Secretary of State, but he went and visited Afal al-Assad, and he turned around to him and went, the Israelis look at you the same way we look at Indians. Oh, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. And oh, it's so such a perfect expression. I mean, to the point where there have been British politicians, I think it was last year or the year before, that were like, gosh, shocked at the settler program that's going on in Israel. For those dickheads to even be mentioning it, and like, uh, good on you for being pissed about it 70 years later. Like, uh, fucking someone's late to the party. But the, uh, you know, like, the fact that even they're going to a point where they're like, oh my God, this is fucking mental. It's going to cause fucking problems shows that it's not just like bad in the sense of they're doing terrible things. They're like at the extent that the other people who also do all these terrible things are like, that might be a bit too far. Hmm. Oh, it goes further than that. You know, like um, they have a plan. This government has a plan to, um, uh, to uh, annex the West Bank, you know, in more than a preliminary fashion like they're doing now. And they intend to uh, declare the Palestinians there as alien residents. Okay, so they don't have to give them a citizenship and they don't have to give them a vote, but they're going to annex the territory. And uh, probably more than just Sector C, which is 70%, but they're going to take a and then even, you know, Sector A, you know, the, the, the municipalities, they're invading them with the military during the day to uh, go and arrest people. They just killed, you know, eight people in Nablus the other day, you know, while doing so. They just considered, yeah, right, you know, to, to, you know, to stomp on, you know, anything, anywhere, anytime. So that's one thing. Another thing is that, you know, in theocratic, you know, like Zionism, there is something called, in Hebrew, a melchuma mitzvah, okay? In... Uh, Islam, this is called a jihad or holy war. In uh, English, Christianity, this is called a crusade. And this is what they're doing. They're into doing a holy war against the Palestinian people to expel them or to uh, um, ghettoize them, basically. And this is a policy of ghettoization and expulsion. And anybody convicted of anything, you know, under the uh, Zionist judiciary will now be declared, you know, um, 
suitable for expulsion. They can expel anybody they can convict of a certain sort of, you know, crime that they make up, of course, with secret evidence to boot. So, uh, you yeah, know, you just have to be out. on their radar and they'll just make shit up and fuck you out. Yeah. Um, and with the ghettoization, like a lot of people would like, um, uh, a lot of people must look at the big comparisons that link a lot of countries up in regards to the ghettoization of colonized peoples. A lot of people would very rightly link it up to America and its ghettoization of the black community. Absolutely correct. But I think there is a better example that is linked to both of these um, that isn't any less important than America as an example in here. But I would say Poland, World War II. Perfect Poland. example of it. Poland, yeah, is, a, is now a presently a Christian nation state. I applied to have my citizenship recognized, you know, because my parents are from Poland and they were Polish. They even spoke Polish to each other. So I applied, you know, and they put me off for three, four years now. And then finally the governor of Warsaw said, oh, you can't, you know, you have to prove that your parents were citizens, you know, but I've proved already that my parents are born in Poland. You know, I even have the family register, you know, from the town, you know, uh, of the for the birth of my father, handwritten. And no, they don't accept that my parents were citizens. You know, they say, you know, like uh, produce a passport. They say, you know, how's, you know, like Jewish people under Nazi occupation is supposed to obtain a passport, you know, to leave. They, they just just go down to the Nazi office. Yeah, yeah, sure. Make sure to wear your Star of David um, <laughs> and then go ask the Nazis if you could have a passport because they'll definitely let you go travel to anywhere that's not in their control. Yeah, no, you know, but at that point, you know, after the uh, occupation, military occupation by the Nazis, you know, you know, Jewish people weren't allowed to escape. You know, they were meant for, you know, elimination, extermination. It was a conscious strategy. It wasn't, you know, default, you know, of illness and, and uh, overwork or anything like that, <laughs> which was also the case, you know, but it was a, a policy strategy, you know, of complete extermination. And the Wawansa Conference, you know, for, for which there is a, a film about, you know, which follows the actual uh, uh, text of the minutes of the meeting, which was kept by a stenographer, with all the wording, you know, enunciated by each of the uh, delegates, you know, that they actually said at the time was that they were extending, you know, the Nuremberg laws, not only eliminate and exterminate the children of Jewish uh, parents, but also those who were descended from one Jewish grandparent. This was in addition, and it wasn't even legal, you know, but they just adopted it just uh, as such. You know, the lawyer who actually formulated the Nuremberg, you know, laws uh, objected to this, but he conceded and adopted, you know, unanimously, you know, the plan to exterminate all of the Jewish people, including those who didn't even consider themselves to be Jewish anymore. <laughs> you know? Also, the having one Jewish grandparent is kind of funny because Hitler had one Jewish grandparent, so... Maybe. Um, uh, yeah, Certainly I know it's not fully substantiated, but it comes from his mother's side, somewhere on that side of the family. It's right. just kind of one of those moments of, like, weird weird hypocrisy and there's so many stories about like um because the west tried to make up loads of stories why does hitler hate the jews was it his mother dying or something like that and it's like do they know what country he's in like th there was a long history of anti-semitism that he didn't need to have like a life tragedy of and of himself to become a like yeah. ideological anti-semite yeah yeah it, it was uh, hitler wasn't the one in 1916 before the war was even over that decided to preach uh, stab in the back about the Jewish uh, uh, um, people in Germany because a lot of Jewish people were pacifists. Yes, and, not uh, only that, uh, they were revolutionaries. The Jewish, you know, German Jewish, you know, like milieu were amongst the, you know, um, you know, leaders, you know, of the uh, the German Revolution of 1918. First of all, in Berlin, there was Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht. Okay. Yep. They were even killed Both by legends. the Social Democrats, you know, like the populist anti-Semitism was so strong that even the Social Democrats, you know, like uh, acted on it and, and used it, you know, in order to stop Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Leibniz there. I then mean, in, in Bavaria, in Bavaria. Social Democrats are the moderate wing of fascism. Could be. They can be, yes. And then in Bavaria, there was another revolution. There were two revolutions in uh, Germany at the time in 1918, anti-war revolutions. But the yeah, second the one Bavarian was Soviet Republic. Republic. That's it. Yes. And that was a coalition between the left social democrats and an anarchist, Adler, who was also killed, assassinated mm -hmm. by the counter revolution. A lot of the leaders of the. Uh, and he was Jewish, of course. So, you know, it was the Jewish people who tried to stop the war, stop the Germans from being killed, you know, needlessly in an inter imperialist war. 
And then they were blamed, you know, for Germany's defeat because they didn't, you know, like they would have supposedly would have won the war against uh, France and England if, you know, the, the German workers were entirely 100% behind, you know, the war. Okay. Well, maybe, maybe, but so what, you know, like why continue a war, you know, that was destroying yourself <laughs> and everybody else. It was, but, you know, that was the uh, logic, you know, that Hitler came up with. Yeah, you're right. I mean, also the, um, the KPD was also predominantly Jewish when it, when it arose in 1920. Probably know, a lot. 1919. Know. Yeah. But it doesn't mean very much. I don't think, yeah. You know, like my father was put into a jail in, in Russia, you know, by a, a Jewish woman communist, you know, because they'd missed a day of work, you know, being Jewish, you know, and in the communist party, you know, was not uh, something to be, you know, uh, proud of the record for which, you know, they were operating. But, you know, in that case, they were blamed for doing that which was in the interest of the German working class. And uh, this was turned into a nationalistic crusade against the Jewish people as if, you know, they were responsible for declaring the war in the first place, which was, of course, uh, the Kaiser. <laughs> so I, I fucking heard, I've heard anti-Semites try and claim that all oh, the Germans were fighting against the Jewish bourgeoisie with the German working class. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, it goes on and on and on, you know, this whole thing, this whole conspiracy theory, you know, because, you know, Second World War... you pile up your tower of bullshit? Yeah, and then, second, you know, Second World War was supposed to have been caused by not the Jewish communists this time. It was the Jewish bankers, you know, who caused, you know, the Second World War. I don't know how, but somehow, you know, I've heard that, you know, so many times. Okay, so let's see now. We have uh, just a few minutes left uh, before... Uh, the Zoom deadline of 40 minutes, you know, so let's uh, get into some conclusion here. And uh, what would be your conclusion as to uh, what we're about? So like, what's it? Um, we'll have more and increased conversations expressed in a lot of these things as we go forth. The way I'll apply a conclusion here as to what we're about, what this discussion has been about is, you know, a lot of comrades don't know enough about yourself. And in these moments get to see a lot of the imagery, a lot of the history that goes into uh, your struggles as a second generation Holocaust survivor and the intensity that that brings to someone's livelihood on the scope of revolutionary activity, why, you know, so many of the Jewish community found themselves being socialists and communists, respectively, at the end of the Second World War, and how that compounded, how that history of their parents' experiences, of your parents' experiences, compounded, affected, and developed you as a radical, as a revolutionary, uh, I, I, as a, I, I, as a um, experienced uh, man of struggle, I would say, what advice would you uh, have for young comrades that are trying to ascertain towards political activism or revolutionary work? Hmm. It's difficult.